And at this point, though, I, it's my honor to present my friend and uh, distinguished philosopher and political theorist, Shayla ben Habi, who is um, currently um, a professor of law at Columbia Law School and uh, is also an emerita uh, professor, the Eugene Meyer Professor of Political Science and Philosophy at Yale University, where she taught from 2001 to 2022. Um, Shayla has written a number of books, to put it mildly, mm -hmm. uh, which like fill up a whole page when you print them out. And they include her early critique norm and utopia, um, and uh, some other very influential books like Situating the Cell and The Claims of Culture and Dignity in Adversity, The Rights of Others, translated in a variety of these places, and a bunch of others, my, Migrations and Mobility. Um, and in any case, we're absolutely delighted to hear her latest take on these crucial questions of the role of cosmopolitanism in relation, I suppose, to nationalism and other types of particularisms. And uh, I'm trying to, I think, find some um, possible role for cosmopolitanism despite all the criticism. So with that said, please join me in welcoming Shayla ben -Hadi. Hi, Carol. Thank you so, so much. Um, we have been friends for a long time, but I'm also a friend of the Ralph Bunch Institute. I think this might be about the third or fourth lecture I've held uh, here over the years. It's always a pleasure uh, to come uh, to come back. Now, when Carol and I first talked about um, uh, my holding this lecture in the summer, I was still thinking about migration, sovereignty, and some topics that I have been working in the last few years. And then I was invited um, a while back um, to join writing for the Oxford Handbook on Cosmopolitanism to be edited by Deepak Chakrabarty and other colleagues. Now, what struck me about this uh, handbook of cosmopolitanism was not only the interdisciplinary character of this collection, but also the uh, branching out to other cultures and continents. There is an entry on Confucian cosmopolitanism. That, and uh, this went well beyond the areas of sociology, political science, and religion, mass culture, etc. And uh, I finished my little entry, which was supposed to be 3,000 <laughs> words only. And as you know, that's no more than 12 pages. And then all of a sudden, the topic of cosmopolitanism came to me again. And uh, cosmopolitanism has been a topic in my work for the last three decades. But in contrast to this more welcoming and positive attitude towards cosmopolitanism, which Chakrabarty and his colleagues adopt in this volume, the last uh, decades have been characterized by a dissolution with cosmopolitanism and, above all, by the rhetorical attacks of populist thinkers on cosmopolitanism. So before proceeding, let me say that for me, cosmopolitanism has three distinct uh, dimensions. Uh, first, it's a moral position that espouses the equal dignity and worth of human beings across borders, nations, and communities. Second, it's a meta-theoretical position which sees cultures as interacting with one another throughout human history and borrowing and learning from one another. This is a topic most aptly uh, represented by Anthony Apia in his various uh, works. Third, cosmopolitanism has a legal dimension in that it defends the, that each human being ought to be treated as a person entitled to certain um, universal rights. Cosmopolitanism considers that human beings are endowed to basic rights, and increasingly these rights are seen as codified in various human rights treaties uh, since uh, World War uh, II. And the claim here is that 
individuals are in, and uh, are entitled to these rights not because they are citizens or members of bounded communities, but qua are uh, human. Five, five or five, five or six. Now, each of these premises, uh, the moral, the cultural, and the political, legal, requires independent clarification and discussion for sure. But in this lecture, I want to situate cosmopolitanism as it has gotten caught in the crossfire of contemporary debates in culture, politics, and the law. I want to identify and argue against the drift towards liberal nationalism among major thinkers. I also want to defend a certain Kantian cosmopolitanism against post-colonial and post-modern criticisms. There is much to be learned from both positions, that is both the liberal nationalist critiques and the post-colonial criticisms. So my goal is not to polemicize, but to stage what I'll call a contentious dialogue among some major currents of our times. So let me begin by reflecting on the changing fortunes of cosmopolitanism. The intense interest in cosmopolitanism in the social and political sciences, cultural and legal studies dates back to the last two decades of the 20th century. With the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, the unification of Germany and the extension of European Union to East and Central European countries, the Kantian cosmopolitan ideal of uniting diverse countries under the rule of law, respect for human rights, and a market economy seemed to come alive. During the same period, thinkers who looked upon the Eurocentrism of this cosmopolitan revival with some skepticism focused on what they named cosmopolitics. As Peng Chia, a literary and cultural studies scholar from Berkeley observed, quote, studies of various global phenomena, such as transcultural encounters, mass migration and population transfers between East and West, first and third worlds, North and South, the rise of global financial and business networks, the formation of transnational advocacy networks, and the proliferation of transnational human rights instruments seem to embody a different form quote, of non-ethnocentric cosmopolitanism, which could be better described by cosmopolitics. Yet the upshot of these transcultural encounters, mass migrations, diasporas, colonization, decolonization, all being sucked down into the financial and communicational vortex created by globalization resulted neither in perpetual peace, as Kant would have wished, nor in non-ethnocentric cosmopolitanism, as Chia and other critics had hoped for. Rather, the conflict between religions, cultures, and public institutions arising from these encounters became most visible with September 11, 2001 attacks on the World Trade Center and the subsequent global rise of Islamist movements. Focusing around the meaning of secularism, the wearing of the hijab by Muslim girls, multicultural demands, and Europe's refugee crisis, Etienne Balibar observes that, quote, contemporary cosmopolitics is a particularly ambiguous form of politics it consists exclusively of conflicts between universalities without ready-made solutions, end of quote. I will be returning to Balibar again and again in this lecture. He's also one of the contributors to this encyclopedia, so there is a kind of dialogue going on here. By the beginning of the new century, cosmopolitanism and cosmopolitics had fallen on hard times. As the optimism about the spread of international human rights law waned in the wake of the endless wars against terror and humanitarian interventions, as the many crises of the European Union led to disillusionment with the European project and democratization in Eastern and Central Europe gave rise to illiberal democracies, 
the exit of the United Kingdom from the European Union in January 2020 put the nail in the coffin of cosmopolitan dreams. A slow and persistent rise of authoritarianism, not only in Hungary and Poland, but also in Turkey and until recently Brazil, India, and surely the United States began to unfold. For authoritarian populist movements, cosmopolitanism became the arch enemy. In their eyes, cosmopolitan elites allied themselves with the defense of international law, global human rights, and refugee NGOs, and disregarded their nation's histories and the injustices they have suffered. Cosmopolitans pleaded instead for open or at least porous borders. They became indifferent to the sullying of national cultures by alien values and mores, celebrating instead creolization, multiplication, and fragmentation of national cultures. The COVID-19 pandemic made these populist fears even more vivid. A virus without borders threatened life and health, economic and well-being. As vaccine nationalism spread, and nations began to put up walls and draw up their bridges, a pandemic that required a truly cosmopolitan and cosmopolitical response only resulted in half-hearted attempts by governments to grant and subsidize the efforts of pharma giants, such as Pfizer, Merck, Johnson & Johnson. Suddenly in 2020, spring, our world seemed to have shrunk because the virus was everywhere. At the same time, we were all quarantined in our private spaces. Media giants such as Google, Facebook, Amazon, Instagram, and Twitter dominated communication and information, while real public spheres were emptied out. Instead of global solidarity, we regressed back to national isolationism and selfishness. Major thinkers who had defended cosmopolitanism at one point now bid farewell to it. Etienne Balibar believes that contemporary cosmopolitics does not, quote, prefigure the realization of philosophical cosmopolitanism, but neither does it purely and simply do away with the possibility of taking it as a point of reference. I'll return to, the, to this. Emily after. Okay, now I have her quote. Following Balibar summarizes these misgivings as follows. The cultural model of cosmopolitanism was equally obsolete, resting as it did on a development theory of the subject, divested of the primordial claims of ontological nationalism, as well as on a pre-comprehended notion of the sorry notion of the human and the cultivation quote, of the all humanisms within the disciplinary humanities. End of end of quote. You know, so I want to return to this: a pre-comprehended notion of the human and the cultivation of all humanism within the disciplinary humanities. Whereas in the French context, to which both Balibar and uh, Emily after are indebted, the critique of cosmopolitan humanism owed much to the work of Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault. Martin Nussbaum, one of the early defenders of cosmopolitanism in the English-speaking world, in her recent work, named the cosmopolitan tradition a noble but flawed ideal. I'd like to consider Nussbaum's arguments at some length. This is the book that I'm engaging with published in 2019. In the cosmopolitan tradition, an noble but flawed ideal, Nussbaum begins with a masterful reconstruction of the philosophical ethics of cosmopolitanism among both the Stoics and the Cynics, and both in the Roman and Greek uh, traditions. She observes, uh, justly, I think, taken by itself, this vision need not involve politics. It's a moral ideal. In the thought of many of the tradition's exemplars, however, the idea of equal human dignity does ground a distinctive set of obligations for international and national politics. The idea of respect for humanity has been at the root of much of the international human rights movement, 
and it has played a formative role in many legal and constitutional traditions. End of quote. This is how the argument begins, but it goes somewhere quite different. Nussbaum then traces the evolution of cosmopolitan ideas from Cicero to Grotius and Adam Smith, assuming that there is not much that is distinctive in Kantian cosmopolitanism from these other positions. But my disagreement is not with her reconstruction of the cosmopolitan ideal. Rather, it is with the emphasis on the place of the nation, and in particular, her dismissiveness towards international law. I see an evolution in Nussbaum's position from cosmopolitanism to patriotism, which she has defended in other works, and to a defense of what she calls, quote, a global political liberalism in this text, but I think should be properly called liberal nationalism. Let me try to explain why. According to Nussbaum, national sovereignty is being eroded in the contemporary world. It is even being leached away, not only by multinational private institutions, but also by NGOs and quote, in favor, I have this quote. Uh -huh. and in favor of an international realm that is not decently accountable to people in each nation through their own political choices and self-given laws. Uh, something I'm going to agree with. But for Nussbaum, nations are vehicles for human autonomy and the accountability of law to people. Now, I will characterize liberal nationalism as the claim that, and you will recognize this from John Rawls, that without God-protected borders, there can be no democratic self-governance. There must be a centralized agent of some kind that takes responsibility for protecting a country's natural and material assets, and that ensures continuity of its public and democratic values. Immigration and transnational movements across borders are permitted uh, for na liberal, national, liberal nationalists, but the regulation of their quantity as well as quality remains sovereign privileges. Countries may admit more or less refugees according to this position and respect the claims of seekers. They have the prerogative to regulate access to labor markets and to turn away certain strangers. Furthermore, the rights of strangers who are admitted to such societies are regulated through the sovereign determination of legislatures. Although liberal nationalists consider it desirable that their legislature should act in accordance with international law. What counts in the first place is our law, our precedents, and our values. The liberal nationalist position has a formidable array of adherents, among others, John Rawls, Michael Walser, Thomas Nagel, and David Miller. And I would say Martha Nussbaum, although she thinks of her position in this book as, quote, a materialist global political liberalism based on the idea of, of human capability and functioning. Now, the weakness of the liberal nationalist position is that it neglects international law constraints on the sovereignty of the demos by constructing state sovereignty as if it were solely defined by the self-assertion of the theme of sentence, of course, a position that has now become very popular in American jurisprudence since Justice Scalia. Nobody gives a hoot in the American Supreme Court anymore of, of international law, okay? But think about the rest of the world, of what this means. Right? Under conditions of economic, technological, and epidemiological pressure, the two halves of liberal nationalism often can harm and liberalism is often sacrificed to nationalism. We see this very clearly in the rise of contemporary politics um, and through populist movements throughout liberal democracies who consider migrant and refugee rights to be secondary and in many cases damaging to national interest and self-assertion. Now let me come back to Martha Nussbaum. 
As a liberal, mm -hmm. Arthur Nussbaum stipulates that while nations have a right to defend both their security and their national political culture, or they ought not to give the nod to any preferred religion or ethnicity. People should not be denied entry for reasons of ethnicity or religion. Yet, uh, clearly, <clears throat> okay, okay, not there yet. Yet, clearly, this condition comes into conflict with the desire of nations to hold, quote, immigration law in order to preserve national homogeneity. Page 235, 231. Now, how can Nussbaum square the circle and reconcile these two positions? The nation's desire to preserve their national cultures and yet not to give preference to any religion or ethnicity above others in admission decisions. Our non-discrimination and in matters of immigration and unchecked national sovereignty reconcilable? Is it a matter of balancing the number of migrants or is it a matter of admitting the right kind of migrants? It seems to me that David Miller's description of this project as one of liberal nationalism is more consistent philosophically than Nussbaum's vacillations between liberal principles and national preferences. Now, let me continue on this for a second, and then I'm coming on to the question of uh, feminism, women's rights, and international law. In this recent book, Nussbaum also dismisses international human rights law as being weak and inefficacious and maintains, quote, that the role of international agreements is moral and expressive more than legal. International law does not and probably should not change domestic law directly. Now, a lot can be said about this, but my whole lecture would have to be based on this, on this question. I, I don't know uh, whether she's referring to the Convention on uh, Genocide, Torture, etc. This is just a throwaway by like this uh, page 15, actually. Noting that there may be conflicts between her earlier defense of women's global human rights and these rather cursory dismissals of the role of international law in bringing about the kind of political global liberalism that she espouses, Nussbaum writes, quote, SIDA accomplished little directly. It is also a deeply flawed document, skirting around some of the most important issues, such as access to artificial concept, contraception and counting women's work as work in national courts. Now, this may be so, but surely working towards a global political liberalism will require both the cultivation of transnational women's movements and the revision of human rights documents. SIDA has been criticized by third world feminist activists for prior prioritizing the career's advancement of first world women by focusing on workplace anti-discrimination and anti-harassment issues to the detriment of social and economic rights such as uh, women's health, childcare, and women's poverty. Political liberals, such as Charles Blights, for example, uh, contrary to third world feminists, have criticized SIDA for transgressing the line between faith and politics by advocating a specific vision of gender equality within the, within the family. So there are two kinds of critiques of this document, both from centrist liberals like Blights you know, we're saying you are dictating too much a specific family structure. And third world feminists were saying, well, look, you know, this is basically careers um, uh, uh, feminism. Now, clearly, Nussbaum's position is much more radical than that of many uh, centrist political liberals like Bites. Uh, she's closer in her critique of SIDA to the third world activists who also require the valorization of women's domestic labor. Why then dismiss the significance of international human rights law in giving voice to and facilitating transformations towards a more cosmopolitan vision of human dignity across national borders? Why relegate the international realm to the task of moral 
persuasion alone. One possible interpretation, but I don't think this is a scholarly interpretation, is that it is the influence of the Chicago uh, law school, which has many authors uh, who have taken the big guns against international law. Uh, but that's that's not doing justice to a uh, great scholar. Um, so we seem to have come full circle here. The historical disillusionment with the tragedies of nationalism after two world wars, the Holocaust of European Jews and genocides committed in the rest of the world, which gave rise to cosmopolitanism in the post-1945 world with the Charter of the United Nations and the 1948 Declaration of Universal Human Rights, have now evolved has evolved actually into a growing skepticism towards the ideal of cosmopolitanism. And in some cases, to the abandonment of the Kantian ideals of the Federation of Nations united uh, by respect for international as well as cosmopolitan law. So how do we move beyond this regressive re-idealization of the nation state on the one hand and the rejection in Emily After's work of the old humanism on the other. Balibar's remark that contemporary cosmopolitics does not quote, prefigure the realization of a philosophical cosmopolitanism, but may not preclude taking it as a point of reference is, oops, not yet, is a promising starting point. And let me explain one. As Pauline Kleingeld notes, cosmopolitanism is a contested legacy. Whether one describes Socrates as the first cosmopolitan, cosmopolites, citizen of the world, or reserve the term for the cynic Diogenes Liartus or Cicero or Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor, cosmopolitanism begins with a critique of the polis and the kivitas in the name of the cosmos of an ordered reality whose rationality is said to transcend the many conflicting and often unjust nomoi of the political world. This critique can take the form of a withdrawal from active engagement with politics as it did with the cynic Diogenes and with the stoic Cicero. Or it can lead to the development of a universalistic ethics whose main dictum is not to commit wrong against any human being and not just against those who belong to one's tribe, city, or religion. Ancient Greek and Roman cosmopol cosmopolitanisms lead to a universalism which finds its eventual expression in early Christianity. And here, I want to give a shout out to your colleague, Susan Blackmore, so in her new book, the year one is analyzing the coming together of these various traditions. What critics find most objectionable in this historical tradition is the dualist ontological hierarchy upon which it is built. Reason versus the body, will versus the appetites, polis versus cosmos, nomoi versus fuses, law and customs versus nature. In the evolution of Western thought, these hierarchies that define the human as such have also led to the characterization of the non-European, non-white, and non-Christian others encountered through colonialism, imperialism, and Western domination as less than human. The cosmopolitan tradition, which historically was also a critique of the practice of slavery among Greek city-states, when confronted with the non-European and non-Christian other in the age of empires and colonization, produces equivocations and confusions. Let me turn here to Sylvia Winter, and I thank Bob Gooding Williams several months ago for pointing this text out to me. Sylvia Winter is a Jamaican novelist, dramatist, critic, philosopher, and essayist. She is a Caribbean intellectual who has taught at the University of West Indies, University of California, and was chairperson of African American Studies and professor of Spanish and Portuguese 
until her retirement at Stanford University. She may be known to many of her, but she's a discovery for me. So her work combines Latin American, Caribbean, and Spanish histories and literature. She's a most articulate representative of what I have called, in other words, another cosmopolitanism. In her essay, is the, <laughs> the title, Unsettling the Coloniality of Being, Power, Truth, Freedom, Towards the Human, After Man, It's Overrepresentation and Argument. <laughs> Not a good title. <laughs> Winter gives an alternative account of the genealogy of modernity, which she summarizes as follows. One of the major empirical effects would be the rise of Europe, and its construction of the world civilization on the one hand and on the other, African enslavement, Latin American conquest, and Asian subjugation. Following the work of Afro-Caribbean intellectuals such as M. S. Césaire and Frantz Fanon, Winter situates the emergence of the ideal of man as defining a hegemonic interpretation of the human to prove. To unsettle the coloniality of dominant and dominating understandings of being, power, truth, freedom, as one must engage, she writes, quote, in a redescription of the human, in a redescription of the human outside the terms of our present descriptive statement of the human man and its overrepresentation. Winter's language is dense and at times apocalyptic. We are never really told what she understands by being with the capital B and how much Heidegger is being referenced. Nor are we told what truth, power, freedom mean for him, her. Still, there is a lot to be learned from her alternative account of the origins of modernity and her critique of man in the name of an alternative and new subjectivity. In a crucial point of the text, uh, Winter discusses the famous debate between Bartolome de las Casas and Juan Gimnes de Sepulveda in the 16th century. This is the so-called Valladolid debate of the 1550s. Whether the Amer Indians conquered by the Spanish through the invasion of Central and South America have souls and whether they should be enslaved, exterminated, or converted. In Winter's telling, King Ferdinand of Spain, who set up the Council of Jurists and Theologians, came up with a formula that would shift the depiction of the Amer Indians, and the Aztecs in particular, from being characterized as enemies of Christ, Christ refusers, to being irrational because they were savage while the Negroes, quote unquote, would be defined as subhuman altogether. Now, confronted with the practice of human sacrifice among the Aztecs, Sepulveda would justify their devastation and domination by the Spanish crown on the grounds that they lacked reason. Bartolomeo de las Casas, by contrast, would argue that they did possess reason, but were mistaken in its right use. The proper evangelists would teach the natives the right use of reason toward acknowledging Christ and thus save their soul. Through her reconstruction of this famous episode, Winter reaches the conclusion, quote, enter, the projected space of otherness was now to be mapped onto the phenotypical patient and religio-cultural differences between human variations and or population groups, while the new idea of order was to be defined in terms of degrees of rational perfection imperfection as degrees ostensibly ordained by the Greco-Christian cultural construct deployed by Sepulveda as that of the law of nature. So the Amer Indians obeyed neither the laws of nature nor the laws of reason, and therefore deserve to be exterminated in his own. Now we see here the imbrication of classical Greek thought with Christian theology in the service of the construction of the ideal of man 
as the being endowed with reason, zone or gonation, or as the animal rationale. The thought of pagan Greece and Rome is turned into an argument now to legitimize the modern state's rise to hegemony. What this means, of course, is that the ideal of cosmopolitanism now gets itself hopelessly interwoven with the misuse of the ideals of rational humanity in the emergence of Western modern modernity, colonialism, and imperialism. So what Emily after has called old humanism may not be salvageable after all. Asking question. There is much in this account that is valuable and eye-opening, and we must realize that today we cannot write the history of global modernity as the emergence of Western modernity alone. We need to take account the remapping of the world, that the conquest of the Americas, the drive to open Japan and China to Western trade, and the scramble for Africa meant for the cosmopolitan project. Kant, whose views on imperialism are often misunderstood on the one hand, in his essay on perpetual peace of 1795, criticized European imperialism in the Sugar Islands, meaning Cuba and the Caribbean Islands, and denounced attempts to forcibly open Japan and China to European trade. But on the other hand, as developed by Tom McCarthy and David Harvey, can't subscribe to a highly racist anthropology and geography. Given this confused legacy of cosmopolitanism, in the encounter with Europe's others, defenders of cosmopolitics argued that this legacy must be rejected and a different philosophical foundation must be made. Now, here we start moving into some of the a very um, serious, difficult philosophical issues behind this sort of cultural political debate about cosmopolitanism. Do we need foundations at all? Why not accept the conflict of universalisms as Balibar proposes? Would this lead to a relevance? Why search to bring the universals under a common and most likely hierarchical ontological denominator? The cosmopolitical project at this point gets entangled with the crisis of foundationalism in philosophy and the definition of the human in terms of this dualist ontology. So it looks like we need a non-foundationalist understanding of philosophy and a different philosophical anthropology to recall and you know, to defend cosmopolitanism. In various works in the past, I have defended the cosmopolitanism without illusions which rejects foundationalism, but not the search for justification through reason giving in dialogical processes of communicative ethics. Surely different philosophical and normative approaches to justification, such as maybe more pragmatist ones as defended by Cavell are also possible. But what would make the cosmopolitical project as an aspiration to a critical utopia impossible as well as incoherent is abandoning the task of justification altogether. Uh, this is certainly not Balibar's intention. His work on equal liberty is a normative defense of the ideals of equality and liberty through their performative articulation. Uh, put succinctly, we need principles as well as ideals to sustain a critical cosmopolitanism. It is not sufficient to deconstruct, as Sylvia Winter does, the coloniality of being, power, truth, and freedom. We need to move towards the reconstructive task of articulating, my view, principles of communicative reason that is not based on hierarchies in that it considers the speaker of every language as a being to whom we must offer rational justifications if we are to in any way limit their actions and enter into relations with them. I want to leave aside here the difficult philosophical question, whether this emphasis on language is itself a form of discriminatory rationalism, in that it excludes those who cannot speak or articulate themselves from the circle of those to whom we owe fundamental human respect. 
I don't believe so. Communication need not be restricted to language alone. And the body and that reality in general are ciphers of communication. And I've always argued that communicative ethics could be extended in this direction. But let me move from these ontological questions back to the political question of cosmopolitanism. Uh, Gerard Galenti, one of the most interesting social theorists writing about cosmopolitanism, observed four dimensions that have become constitutive of the contemporary cosmopolitan condition. First, the stresses of cultural difference and pluralization within the polity. Second, the interaction of global forces with local context, ranging from creolization and diasporic cultures to global civil society movements such as the women's ecology and anti growth movements. Third, the displacement of territorial space by transnational space, leading to a reconfiguration of the inside and the outside, the internal and the external. And fourth, the reinvention of political community around the new ethics and politics. While the first three conditions refer to empirical processes at work in society, politics, and culture, the fourth, namely the reinvention of political community, is clearly aspirational. In my view, neither liberal nationalism nor a deconstruction of the legacy of Western reason are adequate to this task. This new political community can best be characterized as aspiring to a cosmopolitanism from below, in which the ideals of equality and freedom, community and solidarity, find new articulations through local as well as transnational iterations. This cosmopolitanism from below ought to be an example of a new understanding of community centered there on the interaction of the local with the national of the transnational with regional movements, practices, insights, and ideas. Let me be more concrete. Just as the attack on women's reproductive freedoms and LGBTQ plus rights is taking place in Poland, as well as in Brazil, in Hungary, as well as in Turkey, so too must the resistance to such attacks be organized in local and transnational, regional, as well as cosmopolitan terms. Just as the attack on Kashmiri Muslims who are increasingly robbed of their Indian citizenship must be lo organized locally as well as transnationally, so too must the struggle against the beating of a handicapped African migrant last summer in Italy be organized transnationally as well as locally. Cosmopolitan solidarity with the other goes beyond the old dichotomies of East and West, North and South, to defend the right to have rights in Ireland's terms on a global scale. Just as the continuing deforestation of the Amazonas is an attack on the health of the planet as a whole, it's also an attack on the way of life of the native peoples of this region. Likewise, the land grab by multinational corporations, as well as governments like China, of hundreds of thousands of acres of land, water, and other natural resources in Africa is not only an attack on the environment, it's also an attack on people's democratic rights to be able to control their own lands and resources. Resistance to such land grabs, too, will require cosmopolitan solidarity from below. So contrary to cosmopolitical anxieties and populist denunciations, the cosmopolitan project is not over. If anything, it now has to be realized on a truly global level through movements that do not aspire to speak in the name of a single universal, but which construct a new imagination of a differentiated and non-identitarian humanity for whom the distinctiveness of self and other is a source of creative tension as well as struggle. In this new articulation of cosmopolitanism, we may find pathways towards not only a global ethics and politics, but maybe a planetary one as well. 
The ancient Greek stories who identified the cosmos with reason, those did not think of such reason in Cartesian terms as rendering us and possessor de la nature or masters and possessors of nature as Descartes advocated. Nous was a form of mindfulness in synchrony with nature. Even for Aristotle, one of the old masters of dualist ontology, the movement of the heavens presented an image of eternity, which mind contemplating itself could only proxy. Mind and the cosmos more mirrored one another. For the national law in Kant too, there is an important distinction between the Welt, the world, and the earth world. His political cosmopolitanism envisages the building of institutions in a world which we share with others. But one of the moments of ethical realization that lead us towards cosmopolitanism is the recognition that because the surface of the earth is spherical, we cannot expand on it indefinitely, and that sooner or later we will encounter other beings just like ourselves with whom we must learn to share this surface. This is an odd argument here in Khan. It's almost coming I mean, is to an off, but of course. That's <laughs> the sharing with others of the surface of the earth could form the missing link between worldly cosmopolitanism and then ecological ethics of planetary interdependence. In conclusion, despite growing disillusionment with cosmopolitanism for some, and despite its polemical rejection by others, I've argued that cosmopolitanism remains a noble ideal with much power to illuminate our present and future. So thank you for the I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. It was a beautiful presentation. Uh, very rich, there's so many at the same time idealistic. So I wanted to ask you, uh, I think that you ended your representation with a positive note. So I just wanted to ask you more precisely what are the prospects for cosmopolitanism today? And if this considering uh, the three dimensions that you explained in the beginning, you know, like the moral, the cultural, and the legal, uh, will be put this if you want to try to move forward to this type of uh, international society. It will be based, as you have mentioned before, on international law. Um, also, I, I thought very interesting global social movements that we have many different examples, building of these global institutions. And um, just another question. Um, I just got lost. Uh, I know the, the work of Martha Nussbaum, you know, so I know his her work on human capabilities. I, I love, love her work. The only thing is that I got a little bit confused because on the one side uh, is uh, she advocates for, for human dignity and that therefore we need the law to protect all those rights. But he's not. she's not so for international law. She, for, from her point of view, it's weak. So I wanted to ask you, thinking about uh, cosmopolitanism, what should be her view? Is, is she an advocate for that or not? Because I was, maybe I should need to read um, in more detail, you know, there is this uh, book that you mentioned, because I, I got a little bit confused uh, on her position. And thank you so much for, uh, for your time. Um, yes. Um, let me begin with the second question uh, first. Um, uh, I was surprised by this book, right? Yeah. And, and I like, uh, I've uh, always liked and respected her work, even if one agrees or does not agree. Uh, but I found some uh, pronouncements here about the role of the uh, nation. Uh, very puzzling. And if you know, I mean, after um, uh, Martha Nussbaum represented cosmopolitanism, and this debate was about 20 years ago, then there was a collection of essays called Maybe for Love of Country by George Cohen, and she edited where there was already a kind of retraction, not necessarily a retraction, but about compatibility of uh, cosmopolitanism and patriotism. 
And you know, people like Anthony uh, Apia and even you know, Bruce Ackerman, people talk about to, to cosmopolitanism, patriotism, why not? I, I just saw there was that movement in her in her work. And that's not what I'm criticizing. What is puzzling to me in this book is the exaggerated role and significance that she attributes to the nation. And um, the quotes that I have given to you are all quotes from the text. It seems to me the text really is going one way and another way. Uh, and uh, so there is, I think, uh, an attempt to try to hold uh, the principles of what she calls global political liberalism. And for her, political liberalism is always liberalism based upon the principles of John Rawls, fine. Global political liberalism on the one hand, and uh, this respect, you know, or this new re-evaluation re re of the nation on the other. Um, now, the second aspect of this is truly a very dismissive account of international. The discussion of SIDA that I, you know, put up uh, is just one example among many others. Not only is there a dismissiveness towards international law, but there is also, for example, renunciation of international economic aid as leading basically to, to very little. So the, the whole account of internationalism in this book, to me, is a surprise and it's a confusion. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so I, I'm not polemicizing, I mean, you know, because, uh, and if, you know, if we were to go into a deeper analysis, if we were to do this in the seminar, it begins a little bit with her interpretation of Grotius, whom she <laughs> elevates, you know, to a, to a great theorist of the nation and so on. I mean, the Grotian legacy is incredibly conflicted and, you know, just a great many, I mean, he's also, you know, the, the, the theorist not only of the freedom of the seas, but also the theorist justifying, you know, Dutch imperialism and the theory about the freedom of the seas as part of Dutch expansionism and so on. And that's why Kant says, you know, Grotius is a solid comforter, you know, he either. So anyways, um, uh, uh, just, uh, so I think, I think, I don't think I'm being um, unjust here, here, but, uh, the first, uh, the first question. Look, I think that um, you know I'm not trying to be prescriptive. As I said, um, this is a little bit a, a kind of zeit diagnose, right? I'm trying to sort of understand why all of a sudden you know cosmopolitanism has come into the cross bars. I mean, there is a whole scholarly discussion around Kant's cosmopolitanism, the 1795 essay. How do you reconcile Kant's uh, theoretical philosophy, which is anthropology, which is all over the place? But that was not what I was dealing with in this lecture. In this lecture, I was trying to understand this, as I said, this cultural crossfires uh, between cosmopolitanism, populism, and certainly nationalism, immigration, and so on. But thank you for the question. I'm Jimomir Kutkowski, I'm a professor of international law and incidentally ambassador of North Macedonia here. My question is linked with uh, from a different side. This link cosmopolitanism with the human international law of human rights. And not in uh, not from the aspect of Nosbaum, it's pretty old discussion about the dualism of, of rights. It's known. Uh, not only confused, but it's known, it's old argument. But the problem becomes uh, come immediately from a different side. It's a crisis of human rights, international human rights as such, becoming frozen language. Because Kenyani used the term human rights talk as, ideal, as, as a new and very powerful ideology of a liberal, of a new and more sophisticated liberal approach to the, to the world. And what about that problem? Uh, that human rights and main tool of cosmopolitanism could become a frozen language and power tool in Foucault words, if you want. Just the new power, power talk, power game. Mm -hmm. um, yes, certainly that is that is also a, a, you know, a, an important uh, criticism. Now, I have 
develop a position that I call uh, democratic iterations. I um, admire Cosco in his work and so on, but I'm not that much of a, I don't think that this is just a matter of a power theory. By democratic iterations, what I mean is that uh, this language of rights uh, can be uh, can become part of the vocabulary of global social movements. Kosconyemi, Foucault, and others, and Foucault more than Kosconyemi, um, when they talk about human rights talk, it's as a it's a talk of a sort of um, big humanitarian agencies. And there's no question about the fact that this whole concept of responsibility to protect humanitarian interventions completely uh, you know, confuse what have what was meant by by human rights. I mean, uh, the conservatives used it, you know, to justify many actions. But I'm not willing to uh, let the language of human rights be taken up solely by the powers that be, because uh, what I see as uh, happening, and there are many examples uh, uh, for this, is that when uh, international agreements uh, such as CETA are signed by a country, they also provide a possible vocabulary of struggle for groups in that country, for example, fighting against um, um, uh, child abuse, women's abuse, et cetera. So um, uh, I have argued uh, together with um, my friend Judith Resnick from the Yale Law School, whose work has been very influential for me, uh, for a model of iteration, which also presupposes a talking, you know, so uh, about human rights. So when we say third world women have criticized SIDA for being maybe too focused on anti-harassment and anti-discrimination in the, in the workplace, and they want to open up SIDA to women's poverty, uh, chosen poverty, health issues. Why shouldn't that be possible? Why couldn't you know the conventions? You know what? Why couldn't we develop a more um, a better language of human rights? So I don't think that human rights is the only language of international politics, but it is a much too valuable and important language to be left over. You know to those who claim that you know that they engage in a humanitarian intervention in Afghanistan or in Iraq. It was a disaster. And, you know, call it an imperialist ploy as well. So this is the, this is the, I think, the, the, the question. Anyways, but there are other things that to be said as well. Thank you. Okay, we can go to Lillian. Hello, good evening, uh, Shala and everybody at CUNY. Um, I'm speaking in from Chicago at Loyola University. Um, and I appreciate, um, am I audible? Is it? Yes, yes, we hear you. Okay. Um, I, just, I appreciate the pragmatic construction, um, taking precedence over the just, uh, the pragmatic construction of justification over the search for universal grounds for cosmopolitanism. And um, this is not necessarily a formal uh, demand kind of a question, but where to you are the middle or third spaces where this construction um, of the justification or this conversation can occur uh, and traditionally has been away from the private sphere, away from the state. Um, I'm sure these spaces remain particular and fragmented um, as opposed to a grand international forum, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on the same. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Lillian. It's a bit awkward because I don't quite know how to turn my face, but you know, you'll forgive me. Um, I thought when you first started your uh, question, you were going to ask me about, you know, what this program of justification is and so on. And I'm just going to uh, beg an excuse here that in this lecture, there is already quite a bit going on that I didn't go. I didn't go into communicative ethics. And um, so I didn't say much about that. But it seems as if your question is not about the program of uh, communicative ethics or justification as such, but it's about spaces. You are asking about spaces of conversation and and dialogue. And I will come back, you know, to to this again. I mean, I see so much uh, of transnational conversation and dialogue uh, taking place 
uh, both in uh, social movement spaces and also across some of the web, although that is a very treacherous medium that can go you know, many different ways. Um, but the examples, the examples that I have given at the end of the um, at the end of the uh, lecture, um, uh, indeed, I mean, when I uh, look at the critique, let's say, of um, LGBTQ rights by a Recep Tayyip Erdogan or by a Vladimir Putin or by a, a Donald uh, Trump, there is no distinction. It's the same language, right? And if that's the same language, there is also the, the conversation, the transnational conversation against that characterization is itself also a transnational conversation and should share uh, with one uh, with one another. So I guess uh, if I understood you correctly, if your question is about spaces where this is taking place, uh, I don't see civil society, transnational civil society as a prison house. I see it as as having you know many different many different and contradictory moments and and spaces. And again, I hope I have heard the question correctly. Thanks. Um, so thank you for your um, for your present your um, provoking ideas, provocative ideas. Um, yes, and I'm thinking about the challenge that you show uh, in, your, in your presentation and in how constructed a new cosmopolis, cosmopolitan. So this is a, this is a challenge. And um, I'm thinking in, um, in, in one of texts of Zero Winter, there is uh, no human involved uh, where she uh, which she um, analyzed the uh, the, the procedure, procedures of the uh, policemen judgment in the Hodgney King case um, in the West. Hod Hodgney King Oh, Rodney King. Yes. Rodney King. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, okay. So the question is yes, Hodgley King uh, was killed by the, the policeman in Los Angeles. And Sylvia uh, tries to show in this article the question of the violence. So that that is, um, that seems to, uh, that seems to be the main question, the main topic in terms of how the human rights are not being considered in terms of law. And uh, yes, that's it. So I wonder, I wonder if how you think the violence uh, in terms of uh, philosophical uh, topic um in this reconsideration of the cosmopolitanism um the, uh, you will have to give me the reference to the text as i said i'm uh, just beginning uh, also to deal with uh, uh sylvia winter i certainly know her less than i know my count you know that's for sure <laughs> um no uh, your question about violence, there is some echoes with the question asked by the gentleman here in the front about um, the rights of power talk. Um, it, I want to um, approach it in this way. I mean, it's um, um, it's a it, it's a difficult issue that there is a way in which I think establishment liberal culture hijacks and impoverishes rights. And I think that um, part of the uh, critique, be it you know, post-colonial, post one accepts this impoverishment necessary. Now, my uh, claim is um, 
what we need to fight for is an expansion and an enrichment of the concept. Why leave it? Why leave it uh, to them? And in the uh, in the Rodney King case, which of course Bob edited a book about this, Bob Reading was here. It gets you know repeated so many. I mean, the horrifying thing about our political culture is the way in which the scenario has been playing out like like a nightmare. You know, it's uh, it's it goes on. But it, it, what is at stake is um, the violence that reduces, you know, the person to a thing, right? I mean, um, but can you think about that violence without also thinking about human dignity? <laughs> can you think about that violence without saying this person is also a human being and an American citizen, you know, you know a human being to whom I have certain moral and political obligations. If you just want to think about, you know, about the language of violence, I mean, I go back here to Hannah Arendt, right? you know, violence is dumb, it's a stum, it's a language without words, not dumb, but it's, you know, uh, without words, stum, uh, that is to say. And uh, so the language of violence, uh, you know, I mean, violence becomes political when it is given and explanation and justification becomes part of an ideology. But the, the, but the fundamental language of violence is the reduction of the other through force to the thing, right? And we, we but how do we, how do we recoup a sense of dignity and, uh, and the, uh, the right of that human being to human worthiness, right? And uh, it's just like I mean, it, it's uh, this is uh, this is very difficult, and uh, it's so sad. Also, you know, um, it's just like maybe you know, also there is a feminist aspect with that. In the moment of you know extreme violence, that the calling out for the mother, you know, I haven't begun to reflect about this, but it just is very it's very interesting, right? In both the case of, of Kylie. And in the case of Rottington, that there is all of a sudden the appeal to the to the maternal, to the feminine, to to come in for the rescue, etc. It's 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 very it's very powerful. But so I think violence, dignity, rights. You know, it's just I can't think. I just don't want to think simply about about violence. I want to think about what it excludes. Okay, we have a follow up question. Yeah, just a follow up. Mm -hmm. um, it's happened about twice. Um, but um, just a couple of things about, about the winter. I mean, the essay that this young lady is um, invoking actually um, uh, comes maybe about 20, I, I think it comes, you know, immediately after um, the you know, Rodney King events. And I guess there for about 10 years before unsettling the coloniality of being. But, but uh, but much of the argument that you find in and knowing that's involved um, uh, anticipates uh, the argument uh, on unsettling the colonial coloniality of being. And it comes the, the, the title comes from um, the, I guess the LAPD. You know when you know uh, comes from what? the LAPD. You know oh, when yeah. when the, yeah, yeah. the the when the LAPD when 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 a black person was 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 shot. Or there, there was some 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 violence was inflicted on a black person. You know, they would say no humans involved. You know, that would be the radio communication. Okay, that's why it's that's why it's the essay is entitled "No Humans Involved." But 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 the the, the point I take it that Winter's point there, as well as in, on something called out of being, is that uh, the received conception of the human through all its iterations uh, has constituted outside. And it, it includes black people, but not only black people. It's more complicated than that. Uh, 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 and by the way, I mean it goes through three iterations. Even in the SAU site, it's not you know you start with Blair, the Blair, spirit which is flesh, then you get to the early modern era, which you were kind of where you're dealing with the distinction between you know reason and unreason. And then in the, in the um, uh, you know our contemporary moment, it has kind of a coding. I mean, it, 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 you know, much of what she argues resonates 
with what Foucault, you know, understands as uh, racism against the abnormal. So there's a notion of the dysgenetic. I mean, I, I'm thinking yes. of a reading of Foucault that, you know, Ladelma Porter works out very well and in her book. So the, the, what the, the relevant Liddell book with water, a racism, I think it's called Racism in Texas by Anglo American or some book. But, but, but the idea is that, um, uh, but again, it, it resonates with, uh, with the Foucault because what's at issue is um, those who, you know, are, are, are fully developed and those who are less fully uh, developed. But, 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 but the key point is, with, with, is, is that whether you're dealing with the second period or the, or the third period, you know, you know, certain groups of people uh, uh, don't count as as human. Received conceptual framework says these people, you know, these folks count as human. These folks don't. So it's not. It, it doesn't seem to me sufficient to um, answer the question by saying, well, we of course believe in you know dignity and you know so forth and so on. Because the question is, to whom does this category of dignity, you know, apply? I mean, as you know, in the essay, I mean, she talks about Pico. She talks about in the early modern era. She talks about the origin, you know, uh, what's what's the title of Pico's famous or, 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 or Oration on the Dignity of Man? I, I mean, yeah, yeah. The, the, she she talks about people, P Pico, and and the conception of you know dignity that emerges in the Renaissance. The question is who's included and who's you know excluded, you know, uh, uh, from the class of beings to whom the predicate of, of dignity uh, applies. So so there's 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 I, and I noticed Sheila, in, in your talk at one point you talked about you talked about the misuse I think of uh, of human rights talk or the or the misuse of research or something like that. But I, but I take it that the, the force of a critique like Winters, you know, and, and you made allusion to Heidegger as well. But I mean, the force of, of this kind of you know big picture critique of modernity is that if you look at the big picture, um, it's not enough to say well there's a, there was a mistake. The point the point is always going to be that that um, uh, and this is not going to be resolved tonight. But I'm just Making the the the, the, more, the more radical point that 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 there are certain exclusions that are kind of constitutive of these categories, and if you look really really hard, even those progressives who you know like yourself, who are adducing those you know you know categories you know, like they, uh, you know on behalf of someone like Rodney King, um, um, if if you if if if, if you look you know, carefully at the discourse and how the discourse, even among progressives, work, those constituent exclusions are still going to be operative. So, so I think that's just to say, I think that, um, you know, as Arthur just said to the war, if you make it too easy for yourself and you say, you know, we're concerned with, you know, Rodney King's dignity and that's important because, because the whole force, because, or, or the dignity of human beings, because the whole point of, 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 of Winter's argument is that Rodney King is excluded from the category of human. Okay, um, both times that's, a, that's an important intervention, but uh, it's not enough to just point out to the constitutive exclusions. You know, that becomes, that is compatible with the critical task of reason. We've been doing this. We've been doing it in terms of the constitutive exclusion of the female, the constitutive exclusion of the non-white, the constitutive exclusion of you know, the non-European, et cetera. It is part of you know, the critical task, of the critical project that we always do it. And I do like the third part of the essay when she tries to bring this in also to the question of the megalopolis and you know, of the present and the way in which uh, the sort of the, the third world that was constructed in that, in, the, in modernity now comes in as the refuse, the migrant, uh, the asylee, et cetera, et cetera. There is a lot there. But it doesn't seem to me as if, it doesn't seem to me that beyond the descriptive and historical account uh, that there is anything in the logic that is not that we haven't known since Foucault, and that brings us back again and again to the same to the same point. I mean, uh, um, here's the if uh, Winter's whole point is a kind of Foucaultian de deconstruction of power epistemic, etc. I wouldn't be that excited about. It. I'm excited about it, and I want to learn from her precisely because she's bringing in also new historical. Material by bringing in um, 
uh, the conquest of the Americas, the scramble for Africa, what's happening in Asia and so on. There is also the suggestion of a new, maybe a new philosophical anthropology. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm interested. I'm interested in that in that new because uh, okay, let's accept the, the critical Derridian point, and it's the Hegelian point. It's not identity, you know, without the identity of identity and difference. We know all this, right? But the question becomes: if we just do the the critique, then yeah, maybe it is a little too easy, you know. Uh, is it really to say, you know, just like uh, dignity and worth and and rights? I mean, uh, we've got to be able to say something about that as well, don't we? Well, maybe. I'm just saying it's going to be, my only point is that it's, I, it's, it's going to be a complicated discussion. I, and I think, and I, and I think, I, I was just kind of wanted to emphasize that there's more to the discussion than I thought your answer to that question did, did justice. Well, no, it didn't seem to me that it was doing justice to the complexity of the discussion. I think when it does point in the direction of a new philosophical anthropology, also in that connection, in, in that essay, which she's talking about, you know, the the, the, the the agents of the uprising and other contexts, she talks about, you know, aesthetic practices, cultural practices. Uh, I think in, some, in certain ways she talks, you know, she, she doesn't so much talk about justification, but she talks about looking at aesthetic practices, cultural practices, you know, along the lines that resonated with some of what you were saying towards the end of your lecture, as 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 as, as sites for thinking about um, uh, rethinking, rearticulating uh, 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 conceptions of dignity or you know, conceptions of the human. So I don't think you're really that far apart. <clears throat> so I have a continue. The, yeah. I have a question uh, which is a little different, but I did just want to weigh in uh, on this. Uh, I think um, you did a good job with the, uh, I completely endorse the idea of, uh, you know, cosmopolitanism from below. I would articulate in terms of transnational solidarities across borders and so forth, which you also mentioned in terms of social movements. But the other dimension that speaks for this is to, um, to uh, promote a kind of constructivist universalism, or, you know, what Hegel called concrete universality. Where, which is partly operates through these uh, transnational social movements on the ground, so that um, it's not regarded as fixed in terms of even the notions that are that we appeal to of dignity, but that are open to, uh, which I think you are sort of getting at with your um, communicative side. But you, you know, they would historic, not historicized, but uh, open up a more processive universalization process that is also a constructivist one that would be a direction I would sort of want to see in addition to the from below idea or it goes along with the from below idea. But I had my other question was, uh, I like the critique of, of Ms. Baum, which is of course inconsistent with her earlier view in large measure. The one thing that I think one could rescue from her account or the challenge that she would pose, you didn't address. So it's just a kind of invitation to reflect on this idea of democratic accountability and that she is giving us the core, the only argument I could see for still retaining, you know, nations um, and at least, yeah. Uh, and so in terms of that, there would be a number of ways you might want to go about it, but one of the directions that some have proposed um, is uh, expanding the scope of democratic accountability beyond nations uh, not just as a sense of the European Union and the formal structures of a, a you know, global democracy kind of line, but also seeing it as in, involved in these transnational social movements that should operate consensually and, you know, solidarity movements that do operate more, than, you know, that take democracy as, as, a, as one of the desiderata, not as voting, very well, but in terms of uh, participation, deliberation, and so forth. So I just wanted to know what your answer would be to this down on that account, or how you want to go about uh, addressing the only rational core of a critique, as far as I can see. Uh, thanks, Carol. That's uh, that's uh, uh, a, a good way to put it, the rational core of the critique. Well, uh, 
I mean, the claim that democratic accountability has to be restricted uh, to the nation is, you know, where I come in, right? And um, obviously, I just, you know, said something about liberal nationalism. I, or in my, in other works, I contrast liberal nationalism to liberal internationalism, and you know, the interplay there. But I like. Uh, the line that you are uh, taking that uh, why should democratic accountability be restricted to the institutions of the nation? Certainly, you know, uh, we do demand accountability from the polities to which we belong, whether you want to call it the nation or not, but also opening it up um, not only in transnational uh, directions now, you seem to to want to sort of um, uh, also maybe um, look at look at the way this works within social within social movements. I'm a little you know curious yeah. about how that would go, just in terms of the sociology of the thing, you know, because these transnational these uh, transnational movements uh, are themselves also also local and they bring you know the good and the bad uh bit with them so my question to you would be normative and more <laughs> yeah yeah how do we you know how do how do we reconcile the normative with more <laughs> sociological and of course i couldn't um, you know a concrete universality yes <laughs> so i'll leave it there thank you i, I agree thank you thanks very much sheila um i i know this wasn't a huge part of your talk but uh I uh, mentioned earlier on, I was actually trying to find my copy of The Rights of Others here, and I'm worried I've loaned it to a student who never returned it. <laughs> but um, I, I have, a, I put it in the chat so you could look at it later. Um, but I wanted just to ask, it, it, this is a question I've long wanted to ask you, actually. Um, in terms of, you know, global immigration issues and problem, I mean, we, we see all the um, concerns about asylum seekers and uh, rights of asylum now. Uh, obviously a big issue in, in Europe as well as here and one of the factors in Brexit. But putting that that issue to the side and thinking just about, you know, immigration more generally, including people who are upfront about, you know, economic migration ambitions and uh, migration for other purposes, cultural or religious, um, uh, because family members are in another country and so on. I, I've always wondered why... I don't think you have this in the rights of others, but it's possible you, you've mentioned this somewhere else in, in your writings that I, I'm forgetting or didn't see. Uh, is there, are you open to the idea of some kind of a global treaty uh, or international system that would, in essence, try to create something like a matching market? Um, and there are a lot of actually clever computer programs that could be utilized in such a system. The attempt to match people or families with countries that they'd like to go to. So as opposed to, you know, migrants just going to one place wherever, you know, smugglers can get them or wherever the e easiest overland route may be, um, you know, that there's actually more of an organized process, which, you know, takes account of where people would like to go, you know, say their top five preferences. And then on the receiving end, you know, nations that are willing to consider, um, you know, allowing people to, to immigrate into, into their country on the basis of you know whatever we think the most important criteria are, some of which would be ethical, some historical, some economic, and so on. Um, is I mean that obviously you know is a political question and a uh, a matter of you know creating some kind of a workable system. But it seems to me that this is what would follow from at least some of your arguments, as opposed to just kind of voluntary movement wherever people want, but. So is there a way in essence of giving, you know, people like Chris Wellman, you may know, you know, who who don't want open borders, uh, part of what they want, but also, you know, getting us closer to, you know, I, what that, what I see is one of the main goals of your work. I hope that made sense. <laughs> Oh, John, that is uh, that is a big question. Let me just uh, let me just say that. Um, you know, in the, the rights of others is now, I don't know how many years old, <laughs> I forget, but um, the discussion around um, immigration, the philosophical discussion and all the various, you know, the legal has exploded since that time. And I haven't, I haven't uh, revisited immigration as such. I've worked more 
on the international law of migration. And maybe that's what you're looking at what you're thinking about it, that kind of uh, maybe lacuna or whatever in my work. But let me let me uh, come to uh, what you were saying. There is a lot of um, convergence right now among um, international law scholars who are looking at the foundation of the whole system of global movement, which is the 1951 Convention on Refugees. The 1951 Convention on Refugees is a rickety document. It's like a boat that is uh, getting too much water, and that's kind of thing. And the reason being that it's uh, it was a document, as you know, um, articulated at the end of World War II, and its conception of the refugee as a person who has a well-justified fear of persecution on the basis of, of what are called convention grounds, persecution on the basis of uh, religion, nationality, political opinion, membership in a uh, social group, uh, race. Now, these, these categories are considered um, largely inadequate to deal with today's migratory movements. And uh, what has happened is that both in Africa and in Latin America, there are regional conventions about migration rights, like the Cartagena Convention in Latin America which speaks of a generalized condition of violence, including civil war. Because the 51 Convention puts the burden of proof actually on the refugee. You know, suppose you are escaping from Syria and, you know, you are, you know, swimming across the Mediterranean, you don't want to go to Turkey, you know, how do you get, how do you get to Greece with the proper documents so that the European Union admits you, etc. Uh, uh, I, I won't go into no. detail about the U.S. Yeah, sorry, I get uh, a little bit uh, lost in the we details here. Question, so if you could be, yeah, we should really so John, yes, let's talk over, let's chat over email. There are uh, attempts here to say that the distinction between the refugee and the migrant has to be rethought, and there has to be a lot more initiative on the part of the refugee just being taken up in the law as well. But let's converse further, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I like the paper, Sheila, a lot, and I think you're dealing with various criticisms of cosmopolitanism from the left and from the right, and sometimes those converge, of course, and I agree with the, criti the critique of the criticisms from the right, but there's one element of the critique from the left that I think you're not engaging with, which is when I think of cosmopolitanism, I think about what is the space of cosmopolitanism, how does it imagine where it itself is. And I think this is what Winter is getting at, is this assumption of an absolute point of view. I mean, that's the problem with the concept of the human, is it's, a, it's an absolute point of view that transcends all of location and that can judge as if from what Castro Gomez calls a zero point hubris, right? So the demand for justification, the requirement of justification can, can assume that. I know that's not what you want. I don't think that's what you want to do in your work. But I'm, but I'm really, you know, this is the key to colonialism, right? What, what modern world colonialism did was it created this space from which the colonizers could judge and rank and assess and name and conceptualize. And I'm, I'm just, you know, wondering how this, the dialogic model of cosmopolitanism that you like will help us um, unravel that zero point hubris and move to somewhere different. Makes sense. Uh, thank you, and I, I like that we're putting it. I mean, you and Bob, and you know, I just you're pushing in this, but. Honestly, I, I just, uh, can we do a philosophy without justification? Can we engage in critique without engaging in processes of some kind of justification? 
why why i mean i just don't see it i don't, i have a <laughs> <laughs> just, I, I mean, I understand the continuous critical self-reflection, okay, I, and I'm with that. But uh, I don't, I don't quite uh, see um, why, if in fact uh, the the uh, critical encounter is to. Uh, a construct uh, by first deconstructing assumptions, right? Why that would have to be a zero point, a zero point hubris? I mean, suppose my philosophical anthropology is quite minimal. <laughs> None of you have pushed me on that, but I'm working. Suppose it is, it is quite a, a, a minimal that every uh, speaker of an actual language is one to whom I owe the moral obligation upon justification. I mean, this is something that Reiner forced. That I'm, okay, uh, that is that is a minimum. Why, why assume that this is a zero point hubris? I mean, it could, it has its constitutive other and exclusions if there is an idealization of, or there is a requirement of a certain kind of speech, or if speech is so glorified that indeed, you know, those who cannot speak, but then I said communication is more than, I mean, it's just like, it's not so fancy. I mean, think of the way we deal you know, with young children with, you know, very sickly, I mean, we know this, that communication is much beyond. So, but, you have to explain to me why uh, that that um, process of uh, justification I, is zero point of your grace. Look, I guess you know I you know I could sort of do a bit of a sort of I make a Wittgensteinian move here and say that uh, the language of justification is part of the ordinary language base. I mean, your child says to you, "Why?" Why can't I have two hours to watch the TV? Okay. And then you know, it's just like we were always asking this, this question, this question, why? By what right? Okay. But the question is, does everybody have a right to demand justification from everybody else? So does the United States have a right to demand justification from you know a poor country? No. Right, so so that's the, that's the zero point hubris concern. Um, is there's no power in the analysis that you have built in to it? I think justification happens from local place to local place, but the but the God's eye view, looking down and seeing everybody has a right to demand justification, everybody has an obligation to give justification. I don't think that that quite works with the colonized world. But why can't you why can't you say if the United States does not have a right to demand justification, but the United States has an obligation to enter into a dialogue and understand the standpoint of the other? That's my standpoint. Okay. Because, okay. <laughs> 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 um, we've got to continue downstairs with our reception on the fifth floor. Please uh, please join us. Please join me in thanking Joe Benson.